I don't know if you remember middle school math class. One of those problems they always gave us had a train. <laughs> Started in Boston, another train starts in Philadelphia. They leave at the same time, go in different speeds, and you have to figure out exactly where they're going to meet. Well, I don't know about you, but those were some pretty perplexing and for that time, relatively complex problems that had difficult solutions. And even if I one time learned what the solution was, I don't remember it right now. I do think it included something about a quadratic equation, but I can't remember what those are either. So they remain pretty difficult problems. When we think about problems, though, the passage that we looked at, we heard this morning already, is one where Paul has faced even more perplexing problems than that train. He has argued throughout Romans that God is trustworthy, especially to save us, to keep us in right relationship with her, to forgive us, to live in us, to assure us of her love for us, to help us live a holy life that's appropriate for God's people. But taking comfort and joy from all this is contingent upon being able to trust God. Now we know that's not easy given the problems of our lives. We encounter difficulties like exegesis papers, <laughs> taping sermons. Hey, but really the difficulties we know are those of relationships ending, of deaths that are too soon, all sorts of problems come our way, and in those times we know how difficult it is to trust God. But on top of all of those problems of trusting God, an even more difficult one comes to mind for Paul and for some of his readers in Romans because of a pressing question that he's had to deal with and that he's dealt with now for two chapters, and that is, what has God done? in God's relationship with Israel. Of all the assurances, or all the assurances of Romans are based on this new act of God in Christ, all salvation, all presence of God, and relationship with God are founded on the way that God has acted for us in Christ. But Israel, Paul's fellow Jews, his own people, the people who have had a relationship with God for centuries have not accepted this new work of God in the way that God's election of Israel seems to demand. So, we have to ask, has God abandoned Israel? Now, that's not a hard question just for Jews, because if God has abandoned Israel, how can we trust God? That is, if God has abandoned Israel, what makes us think that God will not abandon believers in Christ? The real question here is, is God trustworthy? Paul's been trying to work his way toward an answer of that for a long time when he finally gets to our reading for today. He argues, yes, God is indeed trustworthy. Israel is permanently the elect people of God, but he still argues that all salvation is in Christ. Well, how can that be? How can it be that all salvation is in Christ? These people refuse to accept that, and yet they continue to be God's elect people. Just how does that work, Paul? I mean, he's figured out lots of ways to talk about it. But by the time he gets to the end of chapter 11, he just sort of throws up his hands and says, truth is, I don't know. Okay. But he also knows that it must be. God must remain faithful to Israel while bringing all people to himself in Christ. In the end, his response to this dilemma is the doxology that was read. Oh, the unsearchable and unknowable wisdom of God. Paul has to leave that problem in the hands of God. 
I tried that with that math problem a few times, by the way. <laughs> hey, Paul leaves in the hands of God what seems to be incomprehensible. But Paul is confident that God will indeed do what seems incomprehensible. That's the confidence he has in God that he expresses in this doxology. God will do these things because of who God is. That is truly something to celebrate and to marvel at. And so as soon as he's finished celebrating that, he says, therefore. The second half of our reading is really the beginning of a whole new section of Romans that tells you how you should respond to the unfathomable love and faithfulness of God. Hear the words again. He says, therefore, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, and do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what the will of God is. The appropriate response to this unbelievable and incomprehensible work of God is a radical change in our own understanding of life. Paul says, be a sacrifice. Your life is not your own. You are to be a gift to God, a sacrifice. Now, we always think about things being burned up when we hear about sacrifices. Of course, that's not what he has in mind here. A sacrifice is simply something completely dedicated to God. And so he says, let your life be completely dedicated to God. And he tells you what that involves. It involves a transformation and renewal of your mind, of the ways that we think about and view the world. Now, that demand for new ways to think and new ways to perceive the world is one we find throughout the whole New Testament. We certainly find it in the teaching of Jesus. There are many ways in which we like to think about the parables of Jesus. We like, you know, the parable of the sower. We like the parable of the woman who's looking for coins. But we really don't like too much the parable of the laborers of the field. You know... That story, man goes out, hires some folks, 6 o'clock in the morning, come and harvest my field all day. And he goes and gets some more people at noon, a couple more people at 3, another few people the hour before everybody quits, and he pays them all the same thing. Now, I just like to say, that stinks. I mean, that is not the way the world ought to work, is it? But Jesus says, well, maybe it is. It's the way the kingdom of God is. That's a dramatically different way to think about how things ought to be. All talk about the kingdom of God intends to say, we're talking about something dramatically different from anything we know about the way that the world works. Being in the kingdom requires a radical shift in our standards of evaluation. Sometimes for transformation, we think about the change of a cocoon to a butterfly, well, that's nothing compared to getting paid the same amount of money for one hour as you get for 12. I mean, there's something strange going on when we talk about the kingdom. And when we go back to Paul, he's constantly talking about how to, you have to think about things in radically different ways. He writes to the Corinthians, spends most of 1 Corinthians talking about what spirituality means. And he says, if your understanding of spirituality is focused on self-fulfillment, that must be transformed. He gets the second letter to them, same folks. He says, listen, I want you to think of it this way. Everything you understand about the world has to change. However you knew Christ, it has to change. And he can talk about it in such dramatic terms that he says, it's a whole new creation. 